the happiness of holiness as we continue this study pursuit kids are dismissed to junior church yes they are dismissed sometimes you got to yell at me Interesting story, Bobby Moore was an England, uh, an England soccer captain who received the World Cup from Queen Elizabeth when England won the uh, trophy in 1966. This is an old, uh, this goes back several years ago. Uh, it's just in a current book. Uh, anyway, he, he won this trophy and an interviewer later asked him to describe how he felt when he approached her to get this trophy. And he said as he was approaching the majesty, uh, He had this sinking feeling in his stomach because as he approached her, she had these white gloves on and his hands were covered with mud. And so he's walking up to meet her and he's wiping this mud off on his shorts and on the uh, kind of on the royal... um, the royal velvet kind of uh, cloth that, that is over the royal box, trying to get himself clean before he gets there. Roberts continues, if Bobby Moore was worried about approaching the queen with his muddy hands, how much more horrified should we be at the prospect of approaching God? Because of our sin, we are not just dirty on the outside, our hearts are unclean. And God doesn't just wear white gloves, he is absolutely pure through and through. That's a book called The Porn Problem by Vaughn Roberts. Now the interesting question this morning as we begin is how you personally process that story. When you hear that story, how do you process it? There's two ways to process that story. One would be what we would call uh, really the kind of the hopeless response. Like, oh no, <laughs> I, can never, I can never be clean enough. I'll never get my hands clean enough that I could approach God and that I could shake the hand of God. And uh, so it's kind of like this uh, dire situation. It's hopeless. What am I going to do? That would be one response to that. The other response would be what I would call the holiness response. And it's, oh, yes. Yes, yeah, I can approach God. God has made me holy. It's, it's that understanding because of the gospel, I am holy. In fact, it's the understanding because of the gospel that if I have not received Christ as my Savior, you know what? God won't let me shake his hand. God is holy and pure. He will not let me shake his hand. But if I'm coming to God with these dirty hands, well, I need to know that God has cleansed my hands. He's given me a new heart that I can come up. I can embrace the Savior. I can shake his hand. I am holy. And that's the correct theological response to that. That through the gospel, God took the initiative to clean our hands. Or at least he offers to clean them if we will let him. Now, here's the implications of this, though. Think, of, think about this. God not only cleans our hands and gives us a new heart. Here's what God does. This is one way to kind of process this. might not be the best illustration, but maybe it will be. Um, is that God not only cleans us and, and gives us a new heart, he, he identifies with us and he puts white gloves on our hands. Now, think about the prospect of that, the apl- implications of that. I have these white gloves on my hands, so I am clean and pure, I've been washed, but my white gloves can get dirty in this world, can't they? I can engage sin, I can engage the vices of this world, the temptations of this world, and, and my hands can become very, very dirty. And I think that might be a theologically way to kind of process that story. I am forgiven, I am clean, I can approach my Heavenly Father, and yet I can still get my hands dirty with sin. I am both pure and holy, and yet I am in pursuit of holiness and and I want my hands to be clean when I approach the Father. We're in this New Year's series looking at pursuit, and we've talked about several things now. We've talked about hope, we've talked about faithfulness and righteousness, and today we want to talk about holiness. And I think that is a tough, kind of a tough word and a tough concept to really understand and wrap our hands around. What does it mean to practice holiness? I think in, for some people it maybe strikes a little fear in their heart. Maybe, fear, maybe holiness gets a little bit of a bad rap, People think, well, holiness, yeah, holiness, that takes all the fun out of life. You can't, you can't have a fun, enjoyable life if you're living a holy life. You know, holiness is, <clears throat> is <clears throat> the exact opposite. 
Well, I hope today we will go home with a different understanding of what it means to pursue and practice holiness. And uh, there are some imperatives, two imperatives we'll see today about holiness that we need to understand. And if we can grasp these in the depths of our heart, it will radically impact, I believe, our life. Now, here's just a big idea, real simple. The wonder of holiness is that it is both, I should say both, it is both attainable as well as desirable. So just think about that a minute. Holiness, the wonder of it, is that it is both attainable, I can be holy, and it is desirable, I actually will see that I want to be holy. That's the simple reality. Let's start here. Let's start by defining holiness this morning. And Jenna read that great passage in Romans chapter 6 earlier where Isaiah has this moment where he sees the glory of God and he cries out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and he's consumed with the glory of God. And the imagery there is so powerful. The imagery there is that there's this God on this throne and the throne's exalted over the temple and just the bottom hem of his robe, if you can just picture it, just the bottom hem of his robe fills up the whole temple. That's how glorious he is. Just his hem would just fill up this whole, all the way down the hall. And that's just the hem. And then his robe, and he's above this, and there's these seraphim with six wings, and they're flying over him, and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, 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 meaning there is, uh, of course, the triune nature of God. He's Father, Son, and Spirit. But the idea of this holiness here is, is just how much God is set apart from us. We think of defining holiness. We, uh, I guess the best way, the best working definition today is the idea to be set apart and that God is just set apart. Yes, he is, he is, he is pure and glorious and everything about him, but he is transcendent and he is uh, otherness compared to you and I. He is simply set apart. We were created in God's image, but understand, even being created in God's image, God still was set apart from you and I. We were not all knowing. We were not all present. We were not all powerful, right? God was those things, but Adam and Eve weren't. But they were still created in his image. They had a sense of holiness and being set apart. But, but God is holy and he is set apart from you and me and his purity and his glory and his power and all those things we sang about this morning. So holiness is this, this idea of being set apart. It's this idea that he is set apart three times over. He is set apart and he is set apart and he is set apart yet again. And the fact is to be set apart means that nothing can compare with our God Yahweh. Psalm 89 uh, six and seven, for who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. God is so full of glory. He is so set apart. The Bible says you can't even look at him and see him in his fullness. You would, not, you would not survive. You would not live. He is so full of glory. He is so transcendent. He is so Holy. You know what's really amazing? If we think about the holiness of God, we probably think about this bright light and his glory, and we think about his creation and how he is set apart in that, in that we get that like the, what, what Isaiah saw. But there's another part of God's holiness we need to really consider. And it's not just that we see God's holiness in creation. We see God's holiness, and this, is really, this really struck me this week in a profound way. We see his holiness at the cross. We see how he is set apart at the the cross. Think about the irony of this simple reality that when Jesus Christ hung on the cross and took all of my filth and all of my sin and all of my shame, it was what? Revealing his holiness. It was revealing that he is set apart. Jesus Christ went to the cross and he is worthy not because he hung on the cross. He was worthy enough that he was the one set apart to go to the cross, to hang there for you and I, and to take our sins. And it's at the cross that we see that he is so set apart. We see his goodness, and we see his grace, and his mercy, and his love, and his purity, that he actually could go to the cross and take our place and bear our sins. When he bears the ugliness of our sins, he proves and reveals the, the wonder of his holiness and how he is set 
apart. I think that is so fascinating. In fact, isn't the gospel what separates the Christian religion from every other religion, right? Because in, in Christianity, the gospel says what? Christ came to earth and died for us. And it just that's different than any other religion where the, the God came and died for his people to redeem them. There is something amazing there, and so God is set apart. That's this idea of holiness this morning that I want us to kind of to take forward. What does it mean to be holy? Well, for you and I even, it means that we are set apart. Jesus isn't worthy because he was crucified. He was crucified because he is worthy. Just, just always remember that. Now, what do we need to know about holiness then today? Two things. Two things. Two imperatives you need to know about holiness this morning. Number one is this. Holiness is attainable. Holiness is attainable. And I think sometimes we may look in the mirror and we may look at our hands and we've been out of that soccer match and we're like, I cannot shake the queen's hands. I just, there's no way I could ever be holy. And yet holiness is attainable. In the Old Testament, Levitic, Leviticus 20, 26 this is what God said to Israel. You shall be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy, and I have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So Israel was set apart as a nation. They were set apart to be holy. Now understand that each individual person, each individual Jew, had the personal responsibility to express faith in God and to put their faith and trust in, in God and have a personal relationship with Him. So they weren't holy personally because God said they were holy. They were holy because they chose to walk with God and to have faith in God. But as a nation, they were set apart. Now, th there is a shift in this idea of holiness when we come to the Jewish experience of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and you transition to the New Testament, to the New Covenant, to Paul. There is this, this shift that is really beautiful when it comes to this idea of holiness. God wants you and I, first of all, to see holiness as a reality. He wants us to look in the mirror and see holiness as a reality. He wants us to see holiness as this incredible reality in our life. First of all, we are set apart as individuals. When we put our faith and trust in Christ, when we respond to the gospel, he cleanses us and he gives us a new heart. In fact, Christ comes and is our life. And so we, we are set apart as individuals. First Peter uh, 13, here's what Peter writes. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So here is Peter, and he's quoting the Old Testament and quoting what God spoke to the Jewish people in the Old Covenant there, to be holy because, why? Because God is holy. So here's the thing. We say holiness is attainable, and it is, and it's real simple. Uh, holiness is attainable because God has called us to be holy. God has called us to be holy, and so God's not going to say, I want you to do something, and then it'd be impossible. So if you ever look at this idea of holiness, I could never be holy. I just, that is so lofty of a goal. I, I know my life. I know my heart. I know my desires. I know my flesh. I could never be holy. Well, not true. God knows in each one of us um, and he's asked us to be holy and so it must be attainable. It must be possible. And the first thing is it, it is a reality that we are indeed holy when we come to Christ and when we are saved. I, I often, I've shared this before, I think this is fascinating. When you, when you look at the contrast in this idea of holiness between what would have been in the Old Covenant and what would be today, really, for us today in this age of grace. But even how God relates to people in, in the Scriptures is fascinating. Think about what holiness means to you and I today. The, the word used today for, for um, holy in the New Testament is this word hagios. And basically, it's just one that, that is sacred. Physically pure, morally blameless, religious, ceremonially consecrated, the most holy one. But, but there's one word that's used throughout the New Testament is the word saint. So here's how God calls people in the New Testament. I think this is fascinating. 
Here's how God refers to us. In the New Testament, he refers to uh, believers as disciples 270 times as a follower of Christ. But catch this, 245 of those times is in the Gospels, and then another 30 times or so is in the book of Acts. And they're mostly historical references back to the Gospels. So when Jesus refers to those who uh, are saved in the New Testament, he uses that terminology uh, 245 times, this idea, 270 times, this idea of being a, a disciple. 270 times he uses the idea of brethren, calls us brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? And then the third term he uses is this word saint, which is the hagios. The word saints, hagios, this word in Scripture, 229 times in the New Testament, 161 times it is used of the Holy Spirit. 61 times it is used of you and me. 40 of those references are by Paul. Here's what's fascinating. You never, nobody in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is ever called a saint. They're a disciple. They're never called it a saint. Only one time is, is it found in the Gospels. The only time you find the word saint in the Gospels is right here, after the crucifixion. And Jesus resurrects from the grave. And the Bible says the tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And that's when many of the dead Old Testament saints came out and walked around Jerusalem on a resurrection morning for an hour or two. And they're called saints. You notice nobody is called a saint until the gospel is carried out and completed in somebody's life. Peter and James and John, the disciples, they weren't called saints. They were disciples, they were followers. You know, you know who never uses the term disciple to describe you and I today? Paul. Peter. After, after, after you get out of the book of Acts, Paul and Peter and nobody else ever calls us disciples, calls us saints. There's a huge shift in our relationship. There's a huge shift in our relationship. And the reality is, is that holiness becomes our identity. Holiness becomes actually who we are. We are holy. So is holiness attainable? Yeah. It's our reality. It is who we are. As Christians, we are holy. And I, I, I'm struck by this because, so Peter says this, right? Peter says in 1 Peter 13, be holy as I am holy, quoting the Old Testament. Be holy as God is holy. But you know how, do, do you know how um, Paul would say that in his books of the Bible, how, in his writings? Paul would phrase that slightly differently. This is fascinating. Paul would say it this way, be holy as you are holy. You're a saint. You are a holy one. Be holy as you are holy. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. How many of you live before the Lord a blameless life every day? Right, none of us do. So when that says, he chose us to be holy and blameless before him, is that speaking about my practice or my reality? That's speaking about my reality. That God determined before the foundation of the world that one day he would have this thing called the body of Christ and through the death of Christ on the cross, he would make a group of people holy and set apart to him. And that would be our identity, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Even when I don't live a blameless life, I am blameless. Even when I don't always live out my holiness, I am holy. It is my identity. Fascinating. And I'm no longer a disciple. I am now a saint. And there's a huge difference there. I think there is a huge difference there. So, we see that holiness is indeed attainable. It is our reality. It is even our identity. And, uh, but here, God wants us to see holiness as a possibility. So it's a reality. It's my state. It's my position. But it's also a possibility. What does that mean? Holiness is a possibility. Well, consider, here's a great passage, Romans 12. We know this really well. This will show us both the reality and the possibility of holiness in our life. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That is your reality. That is saying you have clean hands, and you can go up and you can shake the hands of the King of Kings. You don't have to be embarrassed. You can, you can do that. You have the ability to present yourselves to Christ in that way. But, look at 
the possibility. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so here's the sense of, okay, you're holy, so be holy. You're holy, so live holy. Live out your holiness. Practice your holiness. That's who you are in Christ. Is holiness attainable? Yeah, it's attainable. It's my reality. And it's also my possibility. So yes, I can live a holy life in this world full of sin and and suffering and temptation and where my flesh is always fighting against me, as Paul says, where Paul says, I don't do what I want to do and I do what I don't want to do. And yet, I can live a holy life. I can live out the holiness that is my identity in Christ. I can. It may feel really hard sometimes. And we're going to struggle and we're going to fall sometimes. But that's okay. That is okay. Never feel like holiness is something that is so beyond you and that is so lofty. And I don't care what you may have done in your past. I don't care what's going on in your life right now. You can live out your holiness before the Lord. You can because you are holy and because of your grace. Here's a great, here's a great quote by uh, Pastor Mark Deaver. He's a pastor somewhere in, in uh, Washington. Without the holiness of God, sin has no meaning and grace has no point. In, in other words, without the holiness of God, okay, um, <clears throat> well, well, my sin puts the, my, God's holiness puts my sin in context. My holiness puts God's sin in context. God is holy, and when I look at my holiness, his holiness compared to my sin, it puts it in context. At the same time, without the holiness of God, grace has no point. And see, here's God's grace. God's grace comes along and says, I don't care what you've done in your past. I don't care what your history is. I don't care what your life, I don't care. Grace says you can move forward, and you can actually live out the holiness of God. He will make you holy so you can then live holy. I can actually look holy. How crazy is that? Now the $10,000 question, and we'll delve into this more next week, the $10,000 question really is, how do I experience this holiness? How do I live out this holiness? How do I develop this holiness? How do I learn? If I'm holy, how do I learn to be holy? How do I learn to do that? And we'll talk about it next week, but here's the the, the short of it. The more I develop my intimacy with God, the more he develops his holiness in me. The more I develop my intimacy with God, the more he develops his holiness in me. It's just spending time with God. It's just the more we spend time with God and we spend time in his word, he will change us. That's the reality. There's an amazing story in the Bible regarding Moses. And so, you know, uh, Moses was set apart to kind of lead the Israelites, right? And, and so God would have Moses go up the mountain and he would go up the mountain and he would be with God sometimes for extended periods of time. Like he was on the mountain one time for 40 days. And so he would come down, he would get the law and he'd spend this time with God. And the Bible says he'd come down the mountain and his face would glow. His face would glow and radiate that he had been with God. Now, he had not looked directly at God because you can't look directly at God and live, but he was in God's presence and it changed him. And the simple application for you and I is that if you spend time with Christ, I'm not saying that your face is going to (laughs) glow, but you probably will glow and radiate in ways and people will look at you and say, boy, something different about you but he's going to change us he's going to draw that holiness out of us he's going to pull that veil off of our heart and his glory and his holiness is going to shine through so first imperative we need to know today is that holiness is indeed attainable here's the second one holiness is desirable Holiness is desirable. Yes, you can actually desire holiness. And if there's this myth that holiness will take all the fun and joy out of your life, I'm here to tell you that is a myth and you need to know that. In the Old Testament, Nineveh was responsible for rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem. Um, Interesting story, the Israelites were in captivity to Babylon and then after a period of time they come back and three really three different groups come back over three different periods of time the first group came back and rebuilt the temple 
Uh, but Nehemiah is in the third group and he comes back and rebuilds the walls. I was reading this this week and it was fascinating. I think here's our national discussion. Should we build a wall in America, right? Is it a moral thing to do? And you know what? Well, there's your answer. God had Israel build a wall around the nation. And you know what? When Israel, when Israel didn't have a wall, you know how bad the nation looked? It looked really bad inside the nation without the wall. It was symbolic of, of a nation that was in ruins. And so they came back and they built a wall and rebuilt the city and protected themselves from within so they could be a force going out. And uh, so, you know, actually, I mean, my, that's the, the politically, that's not a political issue. Really. That's, there's a good biblical basis there for having a wall. Anyway, but here's the fascinating thing. Listen to what they say here in Nehemiah. I'll just read it to you. This is fascinating. They come back and they build the wall. And after they rebuild the wall, they celebrate. By, well, they read the scriptures, I should say. They have a, a time of reading the scriptures. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing to eat for this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. And so do you understand here that when they heard the law read, they grieved and they, they had remorse and repentance in their heart and that's all good. But but Nehemiah comes back then and says, hey, wait, you got to understand something. This is not a day to mourn and grieve. This is a holy day set apart to the Lord. If it's a holy day, it should be full of joy. When your life is full of the holiness of God, you will know joy. In fact, it's fascinating. Here, here's the thing. It says they were able to rejoice, to express joy over and over and over. Why? It says here, because, and it's, it's down there, I think, in verse uh, I'm not sure which verse it is, verse 12. It says, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. And I think when we understand what's written in God's word and what it means to us, when we can understand it and apply it to our life, it will cause us incredible joy. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 21, 6, for you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. Here's the principle you need to see this morning. It's simply this. The more holy I become, the more joy I will know. The more, and, and shouldn't say, probably say become, the more holy I live. Because we already are holy. But the more holy I live, the more joy I will know in my life. It's just that simple. Now, I can prove this to you. Let's just go to Scripture and use some practical, logical thinking. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, right? And Adam and Eve, um, did they like being in the Garden of Eden? Was it, was it joy, a joyful time in the Garden of Eden? Did they have more joy in the Garden of Eden or when they were out of the Garden of Eden? Probably when they were in the Garden of Eden. When were they most holy? When they were in the Garden of Eden or when they were out of the Garden of Eden? When they, were out, when they were in the Garden of Eden. So when they were in the presence of the Lord, they were filled with the most joy. You and I, uh, one day we're going to go to heaven. Will we have more pleasure and joy in heaven or more pleasure and joy here on earth? More pleasure and joy in heaven. When will we be most holy and most set apart to the Lord? When we're in heaven. When we never again battle our flesh, battle sin, battle temptation, battle Satan. It's just a simple thing. The more holy I live, the more joy I will know. Now that sounds really simple, right? So why is it not so simple? Well, here's the issue. The Bible is very clear. Sin is fun. Sin is fun. It is. It just, it, it appeals to us. There's this idea that sin is indeed fun. But here's the reality. Sin is fun, but the fun is fleeting. Here is the testimony from Moses. It's not on the screen. By faith, Moses, we read this a few weeks ago, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. 
He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is visible. And so he traded the temporary pleasure and, and, and fun that sin offered him when he was in, the, in Pharaoh's palace for what God promised him over there in the promised land and, and, and the, 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 the deeper joy, the deeper joy. Sin is fun, but the fun is fleeting. It doesn't last. And eventually we come to realize whatever fun that was, there comes a point where, you know, that wasn't so fun. It just wasn't. But sin does appeal to our flesh, and it is fun in the moment. It's just a fleetingness. What is holiness but being set apart? When you begin to consider what a life is that is set apart looks like, you can begin to understand why holiness can lead to happiness. So let me leave you this morning with four simple examples of what it looks like when we live a holy and set apart life. What does it look like when I live this life that is holy and set apart? Four simple examples. First one, use your story to bring God glory. When I use my story to bring God glory, that's living in holiness. When my life is all about his life, and that's what Jesus exemplified on the cross, he came to earth and his life was all about bringing glory to the Father. We talked last week about choosing righteousness, right, by surrendering our rights, and we talked about four examples of that. That's an example, really, of using your story to bring glory to God. That's an example of living a life of holiness. When we surrender our rights and choose righteousness, there's a real connection there. Jesus surrendered his rights, surrendered his life, and brought glory to God. Psalms 115.1, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness is our life all about bringing glory to God the father here's a second example don't seek pleasure but pursue your greatest treasure don't seek pleasure but pursue your greatest treasure the truth is holiness will impact our lifestyle there's a word for seeking pleasure it's called hedonism yeah our goal in life should not be to seek pleasure it really shouldn't be because it's while it's fun it is a fleeting Fun. And there is a difference between seeking pleasure and enjoying life. And can I be frankly honest? This is really true. The people who seek personal pleasure are the very ones who fail to enjoy life the most. And all you got to do is read through about a uh, hundred Hollywood testimonials and you'll see it over and over and over and over and over. That their whole life is all about them and promoting them and seeking the pleasures of this world. And all you're going to find is people who in the end have no real joy. <laughs> they just don't. So don't seek pleasure, but pursue your greatest treasure. And you want a great example? Go back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve ask Adam and Eve. They'll tell you. Eve saw the tree, right? She saw the tree and it was good for food and it was desirable to look at and it was, oh, it was a beautiful tree and she sought the pleasure of that tree and it didn't take her long to say, that was a mistake and it cost me some real joy because I forsook my greatest treasure, Christ. She was living in his, in his presence, the joy of his presence and Adam and Eve forsook that for worldly pleasure king david said it this way the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restores my soul he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake david understood it that if he had christ if he had his greatest treasure he had everything he could really ever want and david understood something else that his greatest treasure was a shepherd that cared about his soul the deepest part of who he was Scripture calls Christ the shepherd of our souls. He is. And that's Jesus' own testimony with the Father. It shows us the same reality. Here's what Jesus Jesus, uh, said. That's John 15. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Where do you find joy again? By 
spending time with your greatest treasure, the shepherd of your soul, and your joy will be full. And you may not have the fleeting pleasure of sin, but you'll have the really deep joy. Found a fascinating little uh, quote here. Christian author and speaker Deborah Hirsch experienced a dramatic conversion to faith in Jesus after drug abuse and sex with both men and women. She now holds a traditional view of sexuality, but has invested herself in ministry to people on the margins of the Christian faith, including those who are gay. And Hirsch writes this I am thankful that Jesus was a single man, because in him we find the redemption of celibacy and therefore of singleness. And as many of my dear friends both gay and straight are walking the celibate path this gives them a deeper insight and appreciation of what Jesus experienced Stephen R. Holmes says to prove that sexual activity is not necessary to a well-lived life we need to say only one word Jesus no one lived with more joy and more fulfillment more purpose and meaning than Jesus and yes he had the sexual ethic thing down to a T Don't seek pleasure, but pursue your greatest treasure. In the end, you'll find a deeper joy. You'll find the happiness in holiness. Third example, surrender your comfort to build your character. Surrender your comfort to build your character. We talk about this all the time, right? But it is so central to our day-to-day existence and our day-to-day experiences. How do we handle the adversity? How do we handle the suffering that we go through in life? How do we handle the heartache and the grief of this world? Let me go back to Romans 5 again. I want to show you something here. And, and, I, and I, I think I've seen this before, but I've just never saw it together at the same time. So here's the reality. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous, okay, there's that idea of being declared righteous, declared holy, we could say by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. Two things are going on there that I think are fascinating about this idea of our holiness and our set-apartness. Two things that are going on there. First thing that's going on there is God is developing my set-apartness. When I go through suffering and when I go through hurt, when I go through adversity and pain, God is developing my set-apartness. If that's really a word, and I believe it actually is, Googling it, I think it's a real term. But anyway, he he developed my set-apartness. In a sense, he develops my holiness, the thing that sets me apart. Uh, Think of it in a couple of ways. One thing is that he builds my faith muscle. Think about that. Think about having a faith muscle, and God builds this faith muscle so that I can trust him more and more. My ability to trust him and have faith in him when I go through difficult times gets greater and greater. It's stronger and stronger when I go through adversity. He builds that. And then at the same time, he increases my pain level. And, and you know, I, I visit people so often in, uh, you know, um, in uh, the hospital, and I'm sure Eve has this to some degree too. You know, you go in, and you, you ask the person, you know, what's your pain level? What's your pain level on your knees here, you know, Lori? And, you know, and, and so they'll tell you, oh, it's a three, or it's a five, or it's a seven, or it's a 20, you know, whatever. <laughs> what's your pain level? And so... But God increases our pain level. Why would it matter that God increase our pain level? I'll tell you why it matters. Because some of our greatest growth in life comes through our times of adversity and comes through our times of when we have to bear great pain and we bear great struggles. And there is a prayer you can pray if you want to move forward in your Christian life. There's just a prayer that periodically comes up and and God just kind of throws it at you and it's the prayer for brokenness. It's Lord, you just need to break me right now. You just need to break me and humble me and do a work in me so that we can move farther in our relationship. But so surrender your comfort to build your character. That's holiness. And what you are left with after you build your character stronger and stronger will bring you incredible joy. It really will. And that's why the passage says we rejoice in this because our adversity does do these really positive things but here's the thing so here's what's happening when i go through adversity and strength god is developing within me this set apartness right at the same time you know what god's doing god is proving that i'm set apart and i love the translation here of the holman bible where it says this idea of proven character because when i go through these things other people look at me and say whoa you're different whoa i don't respond that way boy 
you handle that a lot differently than I would. And we prove to others that we are set apart, that we are in a sense holy because of how we react to the things that we go through. So in the sense we go through struggles and God is developing something in me at the same time using that to prove to people what he's developing in me and and to bring himself glory. And in that sense, my story is all about God's glory again. One last example here would be the deepest form of holiness is the private life within us. And this is the one that struck me and was challenging to me to stop and just think about when you think about the deepest form of holiness, it is that whatever is within us that no one else can see. We can talk here in the context of all these things of what the world sees in us and how we are holy before the world, but when is it, what, what about when it's just you and me all alone with God? What does God see in me that no one else sees in me? It's the holiness when I'm holy up here in my mind, when I'm set apart in my mind. There is a principle, I've shared it before, comes out of Colossians 3, uh, but I found a, a, something on the internet that kind of expanded on this, and I think this is pretty good, so I'm going to share this with you. You might recognize the principle from what I've shared before, but our beliefs shape our thoughts, right? And then our thoughts shape our words. And you can see this is a little more detailed than I've shared it in the past. So our beliefs shape our thoughts, our thoughts shape our words, our words shape our actions, our actions shape our habits, our habits shape our character, and our character shapes our destiny. I think that's pretty fascinating to look at it in that context, how each thing is just kind of, you know, and, and it starts up here in my mind, right? where no one else can see, in the privacy of my mind, and that's where the deepest form of holiness starts. Now, look at that. You know what's missing off that list? I'll buy somebody a meal at McDonald's if you could pick the one thing that's missing off of that list. Huh? God's Word shapes our beliefs. So it all starts with God's word, with intimacy, getting alone with God's word and just taking it in and just reading it, saturating ourselves because God's word shapes our beliefs. Our belief shapes our thoughts. Our thoughts shape our words. Words shape our actions and all the way down until we have a destiny and it all starts when we spend time with Christ and he pulls that holiness. He takes that veil off of us and people see that we are indeed holy and set apart. One last verse here, Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now notice there where we have our thoughts and then look at this, verse 5. Put to death therefore what is earthly in you, Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, starts with my thoughts. What shapes my thoughts? God's word shapes my thoughts all the way down till it actually impacts my behavior and the holiness of God is expressed in my life. So holiness this morning, just know this, it is attainable. It is both a reality and it's a possibility and you can live a holy life. We all can. I can live a more holy life. Believe me, this kind of message just speaks to me. I look in the mirror and say, okay, what do I want to do to live a more holy life? And then at the same time, it is desirable. Holiness is desirable. And the more holy I live, the more joy I will know. And how can I live out this holiness? Using my story to bring God glory. Not seeking pleasure, but pursuing my greatest treasure, which is Christ. Surrendering my comfort to build my character and the deepest form of holiness is the private life within us that nobody else can see. There are a handful of questions on there that I would encourage you today to stop and process on your own to kind of work through. And and, and I think there's some real merit in going through those questions. But let me leave you with one last thing from New Testament, from N.T. Wright. I should say not New Testament. N.T. Wright is an author. We talk about this idea of pursuing holiness. Here's what he says. N.T. Wright uses the following illustration to describe how we should avoid sin and embrace the way of Jesus. Think of an animal you'd really be afraid of, whether it's an angry rhinoceros or a large spider. 
If you came around a corner and found yourself facing it, what would you want to do? Run away, of course. Well, as a follower of Jesus, that's how we should feel about a lifestyle of greed, lust, jealousy, injustice, or another sinful pattern. Then think how you'd feel if you saw the person you loved best in the entire world who you hadn't seen for years walking down the street. What would you do? Why? Chase after him or her, of course. That's how you should behave when you think of Jesus and the new life that he is offering you and the whole world. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you that uh, we here today that know Christ can look in the mirror and say, I am holy. My hands are clean. I can come boldly before the throne of grace. I I can spend time in your presence and and there's great joy there. And, And Lord, our prayer today is that as we spend time with you in your presence, as we develop our intimacy with you, and as you develop our character within us. Lord, that that as we spend this time with you, that you would just allow us to let your holiness out. To just show the world that we are set apart, that we are different. In the way we respond to life, in the way we handle our relationships, in the things that we do to have a good time. Yeah, we're different. We're different than the world. And we know the deeper and the greater joy of pursuing our greatest treasure, Jesus Christ. Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen.